the communist movement, having made a big fanfare for over a century, has brought mankind nothing but war, poverty, brutality, and dictatorship. With the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Eastern European Communist parties, this disastrous and outrageous drama finally entered its last stage by the end of the last century. No one, from the people to the general secretary of the CCP, believes in the myth of communism anymore. The communist regime came into being due to neither divine mandate nor democratic election. Today, with its ideology destroyed, the legitimacy of its reign is facing an unprecedented challenge. The Chinese Communist Party is unwilling to leave the historical stage in accordance with the current of history. Instead, it is using the ruthless methods developed during decades of political campaigns to renew its crazed struggle for legitimacy, revive its dead mandate, and continuously provide a living environment for the parasitic evil specter. In this historical moment today, it is especially important for us to understand clearly why the CCP acts like a band of scoundrels and to expose its villainous nature, so that the Chinese nation can achieve lasting stability and peace, enter an era free of the CCP as soon as possible, and construct a future of renewed national splendor. From the policy of improving the treatment for the intellectuals after the Hungarian Revolution in the 1950s, to the policy of plots of land for private use, free markets, and enterprises with responsibility for their own profits and losses, implemented in the rural villages after the Great Famine in the 1960s. From the movement of ideological emancipation after the Great Cultural Revolution in the 1970s, to the deepening reform after the Tiananmen Massacre in the 1980s. Throughout history, whenever the CCP encountered crises, it would demonstrate some traces of improvement, enticing people to develop illusions about the CCP. Without exception, though, the illusions were shattered time and time again. Today, the CCP has pursued short-term benefits, and in doing so, has produced a show of economic prosperity that has once again persuaded the people to believe in fantasies about the CCP. Let us look at what the People's Daily, the mouthpiece of the CCP, said in a front-page story on July 12, 2004. Quote, the historical dialectics have taught the CCP members the following. Those things that should be changed must change. Otherwise, deterioration will follow. Those that should not be changed must remain unchanged. Otherwise, it will lead to self-destruction. What is it that should remain unchanged? The People's Daily explains, quote, The party's basic line of one center, two basic points, must last solidly for 100 years without any vacillation. Unquote. Everything is clear. The communist evil specter's determination to maintain its collective interest and dictatorship never changes. The fundamental conflicts between the interest of the CCP and that of the nation and the people determine that this false prosperity will not last. The reform the CCP has promised has one purpose, to maintain CCP rule. It is a lame reform, a change in surface but not in substance. Underneath the lopsided development lies a great social crisis. Once the crisis breaks out, the nation and the people will suffer once again. It is true that communism has been defeated globally and is doomed to become more and more moribund. Nevertheless, the more corrupt a thing becomes, the more destructive it becomes during its struggle with death. With the change of leadership, the new generation of CCP leaders had no part in the communist revolution. 
and therefore have less and less prestige and credibility in managing the nation. Amidst the crisis of its legitimacy, the CCP's protection of the party interests has increasingly become the basic guarantee for maintaining the interests of individuals within the CCP. The CCP's nature is selfish. It knows no restraint. To discuss democratic improvements with the Communist Party is like asking a tiger to change its skin. During the conference of the Political Bureau of the CCP Central Committee after the Tiananmen Massacre, Deng Xiaoping mentioned two hands, one soft and flexible, and the other hard and stern. This is an analogy for the Communist Party's two-sided strategies. Its softer strategies include propaganda, united fronts, sowing dissension, espionage, instigating rebellion, double-dealing, getting into people's minds, brainwashing, lies and deception, covering up the truth, psychological abuse, and generating an atmosphere of terror. In doing these things, the CCP creates a syndrome of fear inside the people's hearts that leads them to easily forget the party's wrongdoings. These myriad methods could stamp out human nature and foster maliciousness in humanity. The CCP's hard tactics include violence, armed struggle, persecution, political movements, murdering witnesses, kidnapping, suppressing those who have a different opinion, armed attacks, periodic crackdowns, and on and on. These aggressive methods create and perpetuate terror. In practice, the CCP uses both soft and hard methods concurrently. Sometimes they would be relaxed in some instances, while strict in others. Or they would be relaxed on the outside, while stiff in their internal affairs. In a relaxed atmosphere, the CCP encountered the expression of different opinions. But, as if luring a snake out of its hole, those who did speak up would only be persecuted in the following period of strict control. A veteran official who had suffered torments in the Yan'an rectification movement recalled that when he was under intense pressure and was dragged and forced to confess, the only thing he could do was to betray his own conscience and make up lies. At first, he felt bad to be implicating and framing his fellow comrades. He hated himself so much that he wanted to end his own life. Coincidentally, a gun had been placed on the table. He grabbed it, pointed it at his head, and pulled the trigger. But the gun had no bullets. The person who investigated him walked in and said, It's good that you admitted what you've done was wrong. The party's policies are lenient. The CCP always first puts one in a death trap and then enjoys one's every pain and humiliation. When one reaches the limit and just wishes for death, the party feigns kindness, coming out to show one a way to live. It is said, better a live coward than a dead hero. One becomes grateful to the party as one's savior. According to modern medical studies, many victims of intense pressure and isolation fall prey to an abnormal sense of dependency on their captors. This is called the Stockholm Syndrome. The victim's moods, happiness or anger, joy or sorrow, are dictated by those of their captors. The slightest favor for the victims will be received with great gratitude. There are accounts in which the victims develop love for their captors. This psychological phenomenon has been long used successfully by the CCP, both against its enemies and in controlling and remolding the minds of its citizens. The experience of China's last emperor, Puyi, was similar to this officer's. Imprisoned in the CCP's cells and seeing people killed one after another, 
he thought that he would die soon. In order to live, he allowed himself to be brainwashed and cooperated with the prison guards. Later, he wrote an autobiography called The First Half of My Life, which was used by the CCP as a successful example of ideological remolding. At the time of Mao Zedong's death, many Chinese shed a lot of tears in front of Mao's portrait, wondering, how can China continue without Chairman Mao? Ironically, 20 years later, now that the Communist Party has lost the legitimacy to rule the country, the CCP has spread a new round of propaganda, trying to make the people again worry, what would China do without the Communist Party? In reality, the CCP's all-pervasive political control has so deeply branded the current Chinese culture and the Chinese mindsets that even the criteria with which the Chinese people judge the CCP have the mark of the CCP, or have even come from the CCP. If, in the past, the CCP controlled people by instilling its elements into them, then the CCP has now come to harvest what it sowed, since the things instilled in people's minds have been digested and absorbed into their very cells. People think following CCP logic and put themselves in the CCP's shoes in judging right and wrong. Regarding the CCP massacre of student protesters on June 4, 1989, some people said, if I were Deng Xiaoping, I would have stopped the protest with tanks too. In the persecution of Falun Gong, some people are saying, if I were Jiang Zemin, I would eliminate Falun Gong too. About the ban on free speech, some people are saying, if I were the CCP, I would do the same. Truth and conscience have vanished, leaving only the CCP logic. This has been one of the vilest and most ruthless methods used by the CCP, true to its unscrupulous nature. As long as the moral toxins instilled by the CCP remain in people's minds, the CCP can continue to gain energy to sustain its sinful life. The question, what would China do without the CCP? This mode of thinking fits the CCP's aim of having people reason using party logic. The decades of CCP propaganda have trained people to think of the party as their mother. The omnipresent CCP politics have rendered people unable to even conceive of living without the CCP. Without Mao Zedong, China did not fall. Will China collapse without the CCP? The CCP's claim to legitimacy lies in the economic development over the past 20-some years. But, Tracing it back throughout history, the reform in Chinese rural villages in Anhui province was initiated by the peasants themselves. The reform in the cities came from requests by business leaders to loosen government restrictions. In reality, these developments were gradually achieved by the Chinese people after the fetters of the CCP were slightly relaxed, and therefore have nothing to do with the CCP's own merit. There are two supervisory systems in China. One is the administrative system, and the other is the party system. The administrative system exists to solve social problems and to facilitate the development of society. But the party system, which does not attend to its proper duties, attaches to the administrative system as a parasitic evil specter, controlling the administrative system and taking credit for the achievements of people's hard work. It has become a malignant tumor growing in the Chinese society.
The CCP has, however, claimed this economic development as its own achievement, asking people to be grateful for it, as if none of these developments would have taken place without the CCP. We all know, though, that many non-communist countries achieved faster rates of economic growth a long time ago. The CCP attributes anything bad to reactionary forces and the ulterior motives of certain individuals, while crediting everything good to the party leadership. For example, the winners of Olympic gold medals are required to thank the party, and the party then congratulates itself as a great nation of sports. China suffered a great deal in the SARS epidemic, but the party mouthpiece, the People's Daily, reported that China defeated the virus by, quote, relying on the party's basic theory, basic line, basic principle, and basic experience, unquote. The launch of China's spaceship, Shenzhou 5, was accomplished with the help of professionals in science and technology, but the CCP used it as evidence to prove that only the CCP could lead the Chinese people to enter the ranks of the powerful countries in the world. As for China's hosting of the 2008 Olympic Games, what was in reality an olive branch given by Western countries to encourage China to improve its human rights. The CCP uses the Games to enhance its claims to legitimacy and to provide a pretext for suppressing the Chinese people. Even the wrongdoing that the CCP commits can be turned into something good to serve the party's purposes. In the early 1990s, for example, the selling of blood became popular in mainland China. The county and town governments made slogans such as, if you want to be comparatively well off, just go sell your blood. Another was, selling blood is honorable. They contrived these slogans to encourage peasants to sell their blood. In the poor rural villages, sanitary conditions are very bad and there is usually no medical examination prior to drawing the blood. As a result, many peasants have been infected with AIDS. In Henan province alone, hundreds of AIDS-infected villages have emerged, and about one million people have been infected with HIV. But the CCP has treated the spread of AIDS as a state secret and forbids investigation. A grassroots-level official even openly said, Quote, the AIDS patients are not human, they are ghosts. When they all die, the AIDS problem will be over. Unquote. When, through the great efforts of some medical workers and the international society, the truth about the rampant spread of AIDS in China could no longer be covered up, the CCP suddenly created a new identity. It carefully mobilized its propaganda machine, utilizing everyone from well-known actors to the party's general secretary in order to falsely portray the prime culprit, the CCP, as a blessing for the patients, a destroyer of AIDS, and a challenger to disease. In dealing with such a serious life-and-death issue, all the CCP could think of was how to use the issue to glorify itself. Only a schemer as vicious as the CCP is capable of such ruthless behavior brazenly and underhandedly taking credit and utterly disregarding human life. In fact, China's economic improvement has nothing to do with the CCP. In order to maintain its rule, the CCP carried out the policies of reform and opening up in the 1980s. Its eagerness for quick success has placed China at a disadvantage, termed by economists as the curse of the latecomer. The concept of the curse of the latecomer, or as some other scholars call it, the latecomer advantage, refers to the fact that underdeveloped countries, which set out late for development, can imitate the developed countries in many aspects. This imitation can take two forms, imitating the social system or imitating the technological and industrial models. Imitating a social system is usually very difficult 
since system reform would endanger the vested interests of social or political groups. Thus, underdeveloped countries are inclined to imitate developed countries' technologies. Although technological imitation can generate short-term economic growth, it may result in many hidden risks or even failure in long-term development. It is precisely the curse of the latecomer, a path to failure, that the CCP has followed. Over the past two decades, China's technological imitation has led to some achievements, which have been taken by the CCP for its own advantage in order to prove its legitimacy and to enable it to continue to resist political reform that would undermine the CCP's own interests. Thus, the long-term interests of the nation have been sacrificed. In comparison, since abandoning communism, Russia has carried out economic and political reforms. After experiencing a short period of agony, it has now embarked on a path of rapid growth and development. From 1999 to 2003, Russia's GDP increased by a total of 30 percent. The living standards for its residents have significantly improved. Western business circles have begun not only to discuss the Russian economic phenomenon, but have also begun to invest in Russia, the new hotspot, on a large scale. Russia's rank among the most attractive nations for investments has jumped from 17th in 2002 to 8th in 2003, becoming one of the world's top 10 most popular nations for investment for the first time. Even India, a country that, to most Chinese, is poverty-stricken and full of ethnic conflicts, has enjoyed a significantly expedited development and has achieved an economic growth rate of 7 to 8 percent per year since its economic reforms in 1991. India has a relatively complete legal system and a market economy. It has a healthy financial system, a well-developed democratic system, and a stable public mentality. The international community has recognized India as a country of great development potential. On the other hand, the CCP engages in economic reform without political reform. The resulting false appearance of an economy that flourishes in the short run has hindered the advancement of society. The partial reforms have caused an increasing imbalance in Chinese society and sharpened social conflicts. The financial gains people are achieving are not protected by stable social systems. And furthermore, in the process of privatizing the state-owned properties, the CCP's power holders have abused their positions to fill their own pockets. While the CCP constantly brags about its economic advancement, in reality, China's economy today ranks lower in the world than during Qianlong's reign in the Qing Dynasty. During the Qianlong period, which was in the 1700s, China's GDP accounted for 51% of the world total. When Dr. Sun Yat-sen founded the Republic of China, the KMT period, in 1911, China's GDP accounted for 27% of the world total. By 1923, the percentage dropped, but still was as high as 12%. In 1949, when the CCP took control, the percentage was 5.7. But in 2003, China's GDP was less than 4% of the world's total. In contrast to the economic decline during the KMT period, that was caused by several decades of war, the continuing economic decline during the CCP reign occurred during times of peace. The rapid economic growth in the past 20 years is, to a large extent, 
built on the excessive use or even waste of resources and has been gained at the cost of environmental destruction. According to Xinhua News Agency, in 2003, China contributed less than 4% to the world economy, but its consumption of steel, cement, and other materials amounted to one-third of the total global consumption. A considerable portion of China's GDP is achieved by squandering the resources and opportunities that should be left to future generations. From the 1980s to the end of the 1990s, desertification in China has increased from a little over 1,000 to 2,460 square kilometers. The per capita arable land decreased from about 2 mu in 1980 to 1.43 mu in 2003. The widespread upsurge in the conversion of farmland to land for development has led China to lose 100 million mu of arable land in just a few years time. However, only 43% of the confiscated land is actually used. Currently, the total amount of wastewater discharge is 44 billion tons, exceeding the environmental capacity by 82%. In the seven major river systems, over 40% of the water is not suitable for drinking by humans or livestock. 75% of the lakes are so polluted as to produce various degrees of eutrophication. The direct result of eutrophication in the lakes is the large-scale death of fish populations. It also has adverse effects on industry, personal health, and the water used for irrigation. The conflicts between man and nature in China have never been as intense as they are today. Neither China nor the world can withstand such unhealthy growth. Deluded by the superficial splendor of high-rises and mansions, people are unaware of the impending ecological crisis. Once the time comes for nature to exact its toll on human beings, however, it will bring disastrous consequences to the Chinese nation. The CCP relied on peasants to gain power. The rural residents in the CCP-controlled areas in the early stage of its buildup devoted all they had to the CCP. But since the CCP obtained control of the country, peasants have experienced severe discrimination. After the CCP established the government, it set up a very unfair system, the residential registration system. This system arbitrarily classifies people into rural and urban populations creating an unreasonable separation and opposition within the country. Peasants have no medical insurance, no unemployment welfare, no retirement pensions and cannot take loans from banks. Peasants are not only the most impoverished class in China, they also carry the heaviest tax burden. Peasants need to pay a mandatory provident fund, public welfare fund, administrative management fund, extra education fee, birth control fee, militia organization and training fees, country road construction fees, military service compensation fees, and in addition to all these, they are also required to sell a portion of the grains they produce to the state at an artificially low fixed rate. They must pay agricultural tax, land tax, special local produce tax, and butchery tax in addition to numerous other levies. In contrast, the urban population does not pay these taxes and fees. In a tree farm in eastern Sichuan province, upper-level authorities distributed 500,000 yuan for a reforestation project. The leaders of the tree farm put the first 200,000 yuan into their own pockets and allocated the remaining 300,000 yuan to tree planting. But, when passing through each level of the government, more and more of the money was taken away, and in the end, very little was left for the peasants who did the actual tree planting. 
Those in the government didn't need to worry about the peasants refusing to work on the project, though. The peasants were so impoverished that they would work for very little money. This is one of the reasons that products made in China are so cheap. Many people believe that trade with China will promote human rights, freedom of speech, and democratic reform in China. After more than a decade, though, it is clear that this assumption is only wishful thinking. A comparison of the principles of doing business in China and in the West provides a good example. The fairness and transparency of Western societies are replaced in China by nepotism, bribery, and embezzlement. Whether China decides to buy new aircraft from France or the United States depends on which country keeps quiet on the CCP's human rights issues. Many Western businessmen and politicians are driven and controlled by economic profits from China. Some information technology companies from North America have supplied specialized products to the CCP to block the Internet. In order to gain entry to the Chinese market, some internet websites have agreed to censor themselves and filter out information disliked by the CCP. This huge blood transfusion to the CCP economy from foreign capital is very apparent. But in the process of investment, foreign capital did not bring with it the concept of democracy, freedom, and human rights as fundamental principles for the Chinese people. In its propaganda, the CCP boasts about the unconditional cooperation and even flattery given by foreign investors and foreign governments for the CCP. By making use of China's superficial economic prosperity, CCP officials have become extremely adept at colluding with businesses to divide state wealth and block political reforms. People are often heard to say, I know the CCP often lied in the past, but this time it's telling the truth. Ironically, in retrospect, this was what people would say each time the CCP made a grave mistake in the past. This reflects the ability the CCP has acquired over the decades to use lies to fool people. People have developed some resistance to the CCP's tall tales. In response, the CCP's fabrication and propaganda have become more subtle and professional. Evolving from the slogan-type propaganda of the past, the CCP's lies have now become more refined and subtle. Particularly under the conditions of the information blockade the CCP has erected around China. It makes up stories based on partial facts to mislead the public, which is even more detrimental and deceptive than the tall tales. Consider how CCTV News reported on SARS in the beginning of April 2003. At that time, the outside world suspected that China had hidden information about the epidemic. But CCP reports told the following story. As soon as SARS appeared, governments at central and local levels mobilized experts to give timely treatment to patients, who were later discharged from hospitals upon recovery. Troublemakers have been frightening people into stockpiling goods to avoid having to go out if the disease becomes widespread. The government has wasted no time to stop these rumors, and is taking steps to prevent their spread so that social order can be effectively ensured. A very small number of anti-China forces groundlessly suspect a cover-up by the Chinese government. Most countries and people do not believe these rumors, though. The upcoming Guangzhou trade fair will have the largest participation ever from businesses around the world. Tourists from overseas have confirmed that it's safe to travel in China. In particular, 
experts from the World Health Organization have publicly stated that the Chinese government has been forthcoming in cooperating and taking the appropriate measures to deal with SARS, so there should be no problems. And specialists gave the go-ahead in Guangdong province for field inspection by the WHO. That was the story they told. Under this kind of media atmosphere, everything seems transparent. The CCP appears to have acted responsibly to protect the people's health and had convinced the people that the CCP hadn't hidden anything. However, on April 20, 2003, the Information Office of the State Council announced in a press conference that SARS had indeed broken out in China, and thus indirectly admitted that the government had been covering up the epidemic. People then began to see the truth and understand the deceptive, villainous methods employed by the CCP. With respect to the general election in Taiwan, using the same subtle and refined approach, the CCP suggested that a presidential election would lead to disaster, a surge in the suicide rate, collapsing stock markets, an increase in so-called weird diseases, mental disorders, out-migration of the island inhabitants, family feuds, a callous attitude toward life, a depressed market, indiscriminate shooting in the streets, protests and demonstrations, a siege on the presidential building, social unrest, political farce, and so on. The CCP filled the heads of the people in mainland China with these ridiculous ideas on a daily basis in an attempt to lead them to believe that all of these calamities would be the natural result of an election, and therefore that China should never hold democratic elections. In today's internet era, if you visit the CCP's official Xinhua website, or the People's Daily Online, you will find indeed that there are quite a few reports that contain negative information about China. Firstly, this is because there is too much bad news circulating rapidly in China these days, and the news agency has to report these stories in order to stay credible. Secondly, the standpoint of such reports conforms with the CCP interests and CCP policy. That is, quote, minor criticism offers great help, unquote. The reports always attribute the cause of bad news to certain individuals, having nothing to do with the party, while crediting party leadership with any solution. The CCP skillfully controls what to report, what not to report, how much to report, and whether to have the Chinese media or the CCP-controlled overseas media report it. The CCP is proficient at manipulating bad news into something that can achieve the desired result of winning people's hearts. Many youth in mainland China feel that the CCP now offers a good degree of freedom of speech, and thus they have hopes for and are appreciative of the CCP. They are the victims of the so-called refined strategies of the iniquitous state-controlled media. Moreover, by creating a chaotic situation in the Chinese society and then giving it some media exposure, the CCP can convince people that only the CCP could control such a chaotic society and can thus manipulate the people into endorsing CCP rule. From live interviews to vivid cultural performances, from touching historical dramas to a great variety of life commentary programs, the CCP's brainwashing propaganda over the past 20 years has become more refined and subtle in cheating. And it is no wonder that so many Chinese have been misled. The CCP's villainous propaganda has been so deceptive that the victims willingly believe in the lies. Even worse, the CCP, which strictly controls media freedom, makes use of overseas and other countries' freedom of speech, it extends its propaganda from mainland China to everywhere around the world, penetrating many aspects of society from organizations to popular culture and the media. The CCP-controlled CCTV can broadcast in the United States 24 hours a day. The People's Daily can publish in the United States 
not only in the Chinese version, but also in English. It can promote CCP policy to overseas Chinese and mainstream Western populations, and in time, carry out its so-called United Front smokescreen strategy. After reading several years of nationalist propaganda on the overseas version of the People's Daily, some older overseas Chinese, who dare not go back to live in China, love the CCP even more than the people in mainland China. Most media sources from outside China are only allowed to broadcast entertainment programs inside mainland China. On one side, the CCP curses democracy and freedom in its own land, and on the other side, it has never stopped taking advantage of other people's democracy and freedom in other countries. The CCP even complains fiercely when other countries restrict airtime for the CCP's unfair propaganda. If the CCP is not a villain, what else could it be? In a democratic nation, sovereignty should lie in the hands of the people, which is in line with the principles of heaven and earth. If a nation claims to be democratic, and yet sovereignty does not rest with its people, it is definitely not on the right track, and can only be regarded as a deviation. And this nation would certainly not be a democratic nation. How could democracy be possible without ending party rule, and without a popular election. Return people's rights to the people. The preceding quotation sounds like something that would be written by what the CCP would call its overseas enemies intent on slamming the CCP. In fact, the statement comes from an article in the Xinhua Daily, the official CCP newspaper from September 27, 1945. The CCP, which had once trumpeted popular election, and demanded a return of people's rights to the people, has treated the right to vote as taboo since it usurped power in 1949. The people, who are supposed to be the masters and owners of the state, have no rights whatsoever to make their own decisions. If you fancy that what's done is done, and that the evil CCP cult that has flourished on murder and has ruled China with lies will reform itself, will become benevolent, and will be willing to return people's rights to them, then you are wrong. Let us hear what the People's Daily, the CCP mouthpiece, had to say on November 23, 2004, 60 years after the public statement mentioned a moment ago. Quote, A steadfast control of ideology is the essential ideological and political foundation for consolidating the party's rule. Unquote. When renowned CBS correspondent Mike Wallace interviewed Jiang Zemin in the year 2000, he asked Jiang why China had not conducted popular elections. Jiang's response, the quality of the people in China is very poor. However, as early as February 25, 1939, the CCP cried out in its Xinhua Daily, the KMT thinks that democratic politics in China are not to be realized today, but some years down the road. They hope that democratic politics will wait until the knowledge and education levels of the Chinese people reach those of the bourgeois democratic countries in Europe and America. The article then continued, Only under the democratic system will it become easier to educate and train the people. The hypocritical difference between what Xinhua said in 1939 and what Jiang Zemin said in 2000 reflects the true picture of the CCP's sinful nature. After the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989, the CCP re-entered the world stage with a miserable human rights record. History gave the CCP a choice. Either it could respect its people and truly improve human rights, or it could continue to commit abuses inside China 
while pretending to the outside world to respect human rights in order to evade international condemnation. Unfortunately, consistent with its despotic nature, the CCP chose the second path without hesitation. It gathered together and sustained a large number of unscrupulous but talented people in the scientific and religious fields and specifically directed them to publish deceptive propaganda overseas, the purpose to promote the CCP's feigned progress in human rights. Basic human rights issues, such as freedom of speech and the right to knowledge, were shoved into the background over claimed improvements in the so-called right to survive. The CCP concocted a range of rights fallacies and simultaneously tried to deceive the Chinese people and Western democracies by playing games with human rights. Article 35 of China's Constitution stipulates that citizens of the People's Republic of China have the freedoms of expression, publication, assembly, association, protest, and demonstration. However, the appeals of Falun Gong practitioners and several other groups have been treated as if they are illegal. Since 2004, some civilian groups have applied to demonstrate in Beijing on many occasions. Instead of granting approval, the government arrests the applicants. The CCP Constitution affirmed the one country, two systems policy for Hong Kong and that there would be no change regarding Hong Kong for 50 years. And yet, it has tried to change the two systems into one by attempting to pass tyrannical legislation, Basic Law Article 23, within just five years after Hong Kong's return to China. The Chinese now appear to speak their minds more freely, and besides, the Internet has allowed news to travel faster. So, the CCP claims that it now allows freedom of speech, and quite a number of people have fallen for this. This is a false appearance. It is not that the CCP has become benevolent, rather, the party cannot stop social development and technological advancement. Let us look at the role the CCP is playing regarding the Internet. It is blocking websites, filtering information, monitoring chat rooms, controlling emails, and incriminating Internet users. Everything it does is regressive in nature. Today, with the help of some capitalists who disregard human rights and conscience, the CCP police have been equipped with high-tech devices by which they are able to monitor from inside a patrol car every move Internet users make. In reality, China's biggest human rights abuser is the CCP itself as well as its former General Secretary, Zhang Zemin, former Secretary of the Political and Judiciary Commission, Luo Gan, Minister Zhou Yongkang, and Deputy Minister Liu Jing of the Ministry of Public Security. The facade they put up of punishing human rights abusers is rather like a thief shouting, Catch that thief! To this day, to protect the gains of special interest groups, the CCP has, on one hand, eliminated their previous facade and completely abandoned the workers, peasants, and the populace. On the other hand, they have advanced their deceitful and villainous means as more and more of the CCP's human rights abuses are exposed to the international community. The CCP has used popular vocabulary such as the rule of law, the free market, for the people, and reform to confuse people. Their primary means of deceiving people include the following. 1. Making laws and regulations in violation of the Chinese Constitution. Laws and regulations in violation of the Constitution are passed on to law enforcement personnel at various levels to provide a legal basis to be used to obstruct the people from their efforts to stop persecution to gain freedom and to uphold human rights. 2. Non-political problems are handled with political means. 
a simple social problem might be treated very seriously, as if someone was trying to take the people away from the party, or bring down the entire party in the country, create turmoil, they might even be labeled as enemy forces. The party would then use propaganda to incite the public to hate anyone with an opinion differing from that of the party. 3. Political issues are managed with underhanded means. The CCP's latest ploy for attacking pro-democracy citizens and independent thinking intellectuals is to set up traps in order to imprison them. Such traps include false accusations of civil offenses such as prostitution and tax evasion. The attackers keep a low profile to avoid condemnation by outside groups. These alleged crimes, which are often enough to ruin the reputations of the accused, are also used to humiliate the victims in public. 4. Making use of forming a so-called united front to dress up the CCP. The CCP knows that its words have no credibility. Thus, one of the CCP's three strategies, united front, has become ever more so its productive armor in days of peace. It extensively trains, supports, and bribes a large number of famous people, overseas media sources, especially Chinese media, as well as Western politicians and businessmen, and scholars. The CCP has them all wave the flag and shout in support of the CCP's basic policies, and carry out the deceptive strategy of, quote, minor criticism offers great help, unquote. All of this is done, in fact, in order to help the CCP maintain its control. Many people know and dislike the CCP's Machiavellian behavior and loathe its struggles and deceptions. But at the same time, they fear the CCP's political movements and the resulting turmoil, and fear chaos will visit China again. Thus, once the CCP threatens people with turmoil, people fall into silent acceptance of the CCP rule and feel helpless in the face of the CCP's despotic power. In reality, who is the biggest source of instability? It is the CCP that specializes in tyranny. The CCP, with its several million troops and armed police, is the real source of turmoil. Ordinary citizens have neither the cause nor the capability to initiate turmoil. Only the regressive CCP would be so reckless as to bring the country into turmoil at any hint of change. The CCP policies of stability overrides everything else and nipping the buds of all unstable elements these slogans have become the theoretical basis for the CCP to suppress people. The CCP instigates turmoil and then, in turn, uses the chaos it created to coerce the people. This is a common action of all villains. In the issue of the Tiananmen Square Massacre, facing those that were killed in the massacre, the CCP and its cohorts did not reflect on whether they were guilty of killing. Instead, they rhetorically asked society and let the people choose, which one is better, suppression of the students or internal disorder that may lead to civil war? What does this act show? It can only illustrate the shamelessness of the villainous nature of the CCP. The CCP is in control of the entire state machine and all means of propaganda. In other words, the 1.3 billion Chinese people are held hostage by the CCP. With the 1.3 billion hostages in hand, the CCP can always argue its hostage theory, that if it does not suppress a certain group of people, the whole nation can end up in turmoil or disaster. Using this as an excuse, the CCP could suppress any individual or group at will, and its suppression could always be so-called justified.
Many Chinese people feel that they now enjoy more freedom than before, so they hold out hope for the prospect of the CCP's improvement. As a matter of fact, the degree of freedom bestowed upon people depends on the CCP's sense of crisis. The CCP would do anything to maintain the collective interests of the party, including giving so-called democracy, freedom, or human rights to the people. However, under the CCP leadership, the so-called freedom bestowed by the CCP is not protected by any legislation. Such freedom is purely a tool to deceive and control people amidst the international trend toward democracy. In essence, this freedom is an irreconcilable conflict with the CCP dictatorship. Once such a conflict is beyond the CCP's tolerance level, it could take back all the freedom instantaneously. In the history of the CCP, there were several periods during which speech was relatively free, with each one followed by a period of strict control. Such cyclical patterns occur throughout the history of the CCP, further demonstrating the CCP's iniquitous nature. So, we should not mistakenly think that the CCP has changed by itself, even if we see some signs of its improving human rights. In history, when the CCP struggled to overthrow the KMT government, it pretended to be fighting for democracy for the nation. The CCP's villainous nature is such that any promise it makes cannot be trusted. Liberate Taiwan and Unify Taiwan have been the CCP's propaganda slogans over the past few decades. By means of this propaganda, the CCP has acted like a nationalist and a patriot. Does the CCP truly care about the integrity of the nation's territory? In the early days, when the CCP set up the Chinese Soviet during the KMT reign, Article 14 of its constitution stated that any ethnic groups or any provinces inside China can claim independence. In today's words, they allowed one country, two systems, or two Chinas, with one inside the other. In 1945, the Soviet Red Army entered northeast China and committed robbery, murder, and rape, but the CCP did not utter a word of disapproval. Similarly, when the Soviet Union supported Outer Mongolia to become independent from China, the CCP was once again silent. At the end of 1999, the CCP and Russia signed the China-Russia Border Survey Agreement. In this agreement, the CCP accepted the War I concessions that China had given Russia during the time of the Qing Dynasty, more than 100 years ago, and sold out over 1 million square kilometers of land to Russia, an area as large as several dozen Taiwans. With respect to other border issues, such as the Nansha Islands in the South China Sea and Daiyu Island in the East China Sea, the CCP does not care at all since these issues do not impact the CCP control of power. The CCP has made a fanfare of so-called unifying with Taiwan, which is merely a smokescreen and a devious means to incite blind patriotism and keep public attention off domestic conflict. What will you take to that office thinking a government should always be monitored? In democratic countries, the separation of powers plus the freedoms of speech and the press are good mechanisms for surveillance. Religious beliefs provide additional moral restraint. The CCP promotes atheism. Hence, there is no divine nature to morally restrain its behavior. 
The CCP is a dictatorship. Hence, there is no law to restrain it politically. As a result, the CCP is totally reckless and unrestrained when it acts out of its tyrannical and villainous nature. According to the CCP, who monitors it? The CCP says, The CCP monitors itself. This is the slogan the CCP has used to deceive the public for decades. In earlier times, it was called self-criticism, and later self-surveillance, and self-perfecting the party's leadership. And more recently, it's been known as self-enhancing the party's governing capacity. The CCP emphasizes the superpower it has for so-called self-improvement. Actually, without moral and legal restraint, the CCP's self-improvement amounts to the traditional Chinese saying of demons emerging from one's own heart. Even though the CCP established the Central Disciplinary Inspection Committee and the Office for Appeals and the like, these organizations are merely for show. They are pretty yet useless flower vases that confuse and mislead the people. They are only an excuse the CCP uses to avoid external surveillance and to refuse to lift a ban on free press and a ban on free political parties. Political scoundrels use this trick to fool the people and to protect the CCP's power and the interests of the ruling group. The CCP has promoted many exemplary cadres and has often attracted some idealistic and diligent people to join the party in order to enhance the party's image. As a matter of fact, the Communist Party leaders transmitted only empty words when they promulgated the following slogans, Communist Moral Quality and Serve the People. The inconsistency between Communist leaders' actions and words can be traced all the way back to their founding father, Karl Marx. Marx bore an illegitimate son. Lenin contracted syphilis from prostitutes. Stalin was sued for forcing a singer into a sexual relationship with him. Mao Zedong indulged himself in lust. Jiang Zemin is promiscuous. North Korea's demonic killer, Kim Il-sung, and his children led a decadent and wasteful life. Many high-level officials lose their positions in power struggles in China's political arena because of corruption. But these are the very people who promote honesty and selflessness in public meetings, while in private they engage in bribery, corruption, and other decadent activities. Many of the so-called people servants have fallen this way. The CCP does not believe in its own doctrines, but forces others to believe in them. This is one of the most insidious methods used by the CCP cult. He knows that its doctrines are false, and that the idea of socialism has already gone bankrupt and is untrue. The CCP doesn't believe in these doctrines itself, but forces other people to believe in them. It persecutes people who do not believe in them. The CCP has shamelessly written such deceitful ideology into the Constitution as the foundation of the Chinese state. The CCP treats such superfluous slogans as intricate profound theories and requires the whole country to study them. In daily life, ordinary people in China loathe the empty political study sessions. Increasingly, the Chinese people have their own ways of dealing with these political matters, since everyone knows that they are just deceptive games. But no one, neither the speakers nor the listeners at these political meetings, would speak openly about such deception. This is like an open secret. Everyone knows the game, but no one will discuss it in the open. People call this phenomenon sincere pretension. When the pretending has been gradually molded into a billion-plus people's thinking, and their habits have become the party's culture, the society itself becomes false, pretentious, 
and inane. Lacking honesty and trust, the society is in crisis. Why has the CCP created these conditions? In the past, it was for its ideology. Now, it is for its benefits. The CCP members know that they are pretending, but they pretend anyway. If the CCP did not promote such slogans and formalities, it couldn't bully people. It couldn't make people follow and fear it. Among the CCP members, there has never been a lack of righteous people who are concerned about the country and its people. Nor has there been a shortage of honest and upright officials who have truly served the people. But in the CCP's machinery of self-interest, these officials cannot survive. Under constant pressure to so-called submit humanity to party nature, they often find it impossible to continue, risk being removed from positions, or worse, become corrupt themselves. The Chinese people have personally experienced and deeply felt the CCP's brutal regime and have developed a profound fear of the CCP's violence. Therefore, the people dare not uphold justice and no longer even believe in the heavenly laws. First they submit themselves to the CCP's power and gradually they become unfeeling and unconcerned about matters not affecting themselves. Even the logic of their thinking has been consciously molded to succumb to the CCP. This is the result of the CCP's mob-like nature. The CCP uses slogans of patriotism and nationalism to incite people. They are not only the CCP's main rallying cries, but also its frequently issued orders and time-tested strategies. In all cases, including matters related to Taiwan, Hong Kong, Falun Gong, and the collision between a U.S. spy plane and a Chinese fighter jet, the CCP has used the combined method of high-pressure terror and collective brainwashing, thus bringing the people to a warlike state of mind. This method is similar to that used by the Nazis. By blocking all other information, the CCP's brainwashing has been incredibly successful. Even though the Chinese people do not like the CCP, they think in the twisted mode instilled by the CCP. During the U.S.-led Iraq War, for instance, many people were stirred up when watching the daily analysis on CCTV. They felt a strong sense of hatred and anger, vengeance and a desire to fight, while at the same time cursing yet another war. One of the phrases the CCP often uses to intimidate people is threatens the extinction of the party and the country, thus placing the party even before the country. The founding principle of the CCP's China is there would be no new China without the CCP. From childhood, people were educated to listen to the party and behave like good children of the party. They sang praises to the party, even told, I consider the party as my mother. O oh, party, my dear mother, the saving grace of the party is deeper than the ocean. Love for my father and mother cannot surpass love for the party. The people would go and fight wherever the party pointed them. When the government offered disaster relief, people would thank the party and the government, first the party and then the government. A military slogan reads, The party commands the gun. When designers came up with the uniform for court judges, they put four golden buttons on the neckband of the uniform. The buttons are lined up from top to bottom to symbolize the party, the people, the law, and the country. This indicates that even if you are the judge, the party will forever be positioned above the law, above the country, and above the people. The party has become supreme in China, and the country 
has become the party's subordinate. The country exists for the party, and the party is said to be the embodiment of the people and the symbol of the country. Love for the party, party leaders, and the country have all been mixed together, which is the fundamental reason why patriotism in China has become twisted. The CCP has made many blunders in history, but it has always put the blame on certain individuals or groups through so-called redress and rehabilitation. This has not only made the victims deeply grateful for the CCP, but also allowed the CCP to completely shirk any responsibility for its criminal deeds. The CCP claims itself to be not only unafraid of making mistakes, but also good at correcting them. And this has become the CCP's magic potion with which it repeatedly escapes culpability. Thus, the CCP remains forever great, glorious, and correct. The CCP may one day decide to redress the Tiananmen Square massacre and to restore the reputation of Falun Gong. But these are simply Machiavellian tactics that the CCP uses in a desperate attempt to prolong its dying life. The CCP will never have the courage to reflect on itself, to expose its own crimes, or to pay for its own sins. Actually, the history of the CCP is a history that rips people's memories apart. The next generation does not know the truth about the previous generation. It is a history where over one billion people live in great conflict, conflict between cursing the past of the CCP and having hopes for the present CCP, and about how they suffered through the process of the conflict. All of the CCP's efforts are to make people forget. All the people's struggles are to try to remember. The CCP claimed all along that it owes its success in China's revolution to the integration of Marxism-Leninism with the concrete reality of Chinese revolution. The CCP has frequently abused the term characteristic as an ideological support for its capricious and villainous policies. Another iniquitous characteristic of the CCP is manifest in its changing the definition of cultural concepts and then using these revised definitions to criticize and control people. These so-called Chinese characteristics have become a euphemism for the CCP's villainous characteristics. The goal of the CCP's revolution was to realize public ownership of the means of production. But capitalism has now returned. Only now it's become a part of the CCP itself. While the CCP speaks about the so-called distribution according to contribution, the process of so-called allowing some people to get rich first has been accomplished along with distribution according to power. The CCP uses a disguise of serving the people wholeheartedly to deceive those who hold these ideals, then completely brainwashes and controls them, gradually changing them into docile tools who so-called serve the party wholeheartedly and who dare not speak up for the people. With the so-called Chinese characteristics, China's crippled capitalism was transformed into socialism. Unemployment became waiting for employment. Being laid off from work became off-duty. Poverty became the initial stage of socialism, and human rights and freedom of speech and belief were reduced to the mere right to survive. Under the iniquitous banner of Chinese characteristics, the CCP only achieved ridicule and absurdity. The 
The CCP, which rules by devious means, also essentially needs a corrupt society as an environment in which to survive. That is why the CCP tries everything it can to drag the people down to its own level. No business can be done without buying expensive meals and offering bribes. No wealth can be made without embezzlement and corruption. Having mistresses has become a social trend, and the honest get the short end of the stick. The whole society only looks to money, allowing the CCP to share its original sin with its people, and attempt to turn the Chinese people into schemers to various degrees. Such a society is the environment in which the CCP feels the most secure. In the beginning of the 1990s, there was a popular saying in China, I am a ruffian and I'm afraid of no one. This is the pitiful consequence of several decades of the CCP's iniquitous rule and of its imposing corruption on the nation. Accompanying the fake prosperity of China's economy is the rapidly declining morality in all areas of society. Corruption, malice, and degenerating social norms are commonplace. There is no longer any basic trust among the people. This is how the CCP's deceitful nature is eradicating the moral foundation that has long sustained the Chinese people. In comparison with China's 5,000-year history, the 55 years of the CCP's rule are but the blink of an eye. Before the CCP came into existence, China had created the most magnificent civilization in the history of humankind. No society in the world has stopped its progress because of the end of one dynasty or kingdom. What will China's future be? What direction will China take? Such serious questions are too complicated to discuss in a few words. However, one thing is for certain. If there is no renewal of the nation's morality, if there is no restoration of a harmonious relationship between humans and nature, and between humans and heaven and earth, if there is no faith or culture for a peaceful coexistence among humans, it will be impossible for the Chinese nation to have a bright future. To eliminate from our lives the iniquitous doctrines instilled by the CCP, to discern the CCP's utterly unscrupulous nature, and to restore our human nature and conscience, this is the first and essential step on the path toward a smooth transition to a society free from the Communist Party. Whether this path can be walked steadily and peacefully will depend on the changes made in the heart of every Chinese citizen. Even though the CCP appears to possess all the resources and violent apparatus in the country, if every citizen believes in the power of the truth and safeguards morality, the evil specter of the CCP will lose the foundation for its existence. All resources may instantly return to the hands of the just. That is when the rebirth of China will take place. Only without the Chinese Communist Party will there be a new China. Only without the Chinese Communist Party does China have hope. 
without the Chinese Communist Party, the upright and kind-hearted Chinese people will rebuild China's historical magnificence.